hour sermon? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I doubt it'll be that long, but you can turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Running the race. How many of you know that you're in a race today? We have a race that we're running, and, and we have uh, rules that the race is supposed to be run by, amen? That's according to the Scriptures, praise the Lord. Well, let me ask you some critical questions this morning as we begin, and we're going to get into this verse here in, in just a moment, but what have you, when, when have you felt like giving up? Have you ever felt like giving up? Anybody say amen? amen. Well, that's not a good thing to amen to, but it's, it's still true. Uh, is it your dreams? Is it some of the hopes that you've been given and the things that you've had, goals, maybe even a marriage that has been difficult or a struggle that you've faced? Do you feel like giving up on God? Do you ever feel like uh, it's not worth it? You know, I've talked with people in the last couple of months, individuals that have felt like completely giving up with all that's taking place. That's where they're at. They, they, they're discouraged. And, and sometimes words are not enough. I don't know about you, but there have been times when, when I've talked with individuals, counseled with them, that they've become discouraged, that nothing that I say seems to be able to get through to them. You ever been there? You ever talked to somebody and they say, well, I just don't see any hope. I don't sense God. I don't sense his presence. And so we need to ask ourselves, where are we at? What are, what are we doing? What, what, what have you left undone? Maybe there's a commitment. Maybe there's a project or a promise or a vow or a pledge that you have left undone this morning. And, and you know that you need to get back to that and you need to, to stand firm in that. What's holding you back? What's distracting you from your walk and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? What difficulties may you be facing right now? You see, these are critical questions when we consider what the writer of Hebrews says here in, in Hebrews 12, 1. It says this, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which so easily entangles us, or ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Father, we thank you this morning that your word is alive and it's active. And Lord, that... You're the Almighty God, and we have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear if we'll fear you, if we'll put you first in our lives, if we'll allow your presence to shape us, to form us, to, to, to give us the strength that we need every single day. Lord, we ask for that continued strength in our hearts and in our lives here today. Bless each heart, bless each life, bless those that may be listening today through Facebook, and, and those that will listen maybe later through YouTube, we, we ask, Lord, that your presence and that your provision would minister in hearts and in lives and help people to know that there is hope. There's hope in a living God, a God that is more than able to meet every need and to strengthen and to encourage and to give us the endurance that we need to run in this race that you've given us. We ask you in the name of Jesus to be with each one of us now encourage our hearts and draw us nearer to you we pray it in jesus name amen you know the bible describes this thing that we're in this lifestyle or this life that we've been given as a race that's what it is not a hundred yard dash it's a marathon how many of you were uh athletes in high school or in college and you ran the hundred yard dash anybody in here run the hundred yard dash oh okay i ran it not very fast but i ran it <laughs> But I wasn't very good at long distances. Any of you real good at long distance running? Anybody in the room? Oh my goodness, we have a bunch of people that are, are not very athletic, I guess, huh? <laughs> That's okay. We don't need to be athletic in this race of, of our Christian walk. You know, exercise really uh, has value to it. But it's not as great a value as what we have spiritually and what we need to have spiritually in our walk and in our relationship with the Lord is most important. So there are those that have become discouraged. They, they need encouragement. They need people to come alongside of them. Are we spending time encouraging others, sending cards, sending notes, sending letters? Are we getting on the phone and talking with people and, and lifting them up in encouragement? But you see, a lot of things... In our life, we've left unfinished. You started well, 
but, but now it's become distracting. The distractions that are all around you, the things that are going on in your life, and you become discouraged and, and distracted. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the life that we're racing in, in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 5. I want to read that to you. It says, Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by completing, competing according to to the rules. So there are rules that God has set down, that the Word of God... How many of you are you, you're going to know the rules if you don't read the Word of God? How many of you uh, buy something and say, I can put that together without reading the instructions? How many of you have ever done that before? How many of you have been unsuccessful before without reading the directions? I remember putting it together when John Mark was just a baby. I, I attempted to put together just one of those little swings. You know, those little things that you put the child in, and they, you wind it up, and they go back and forth. Now, now remember now, I was young, all right? That thing flew across the room. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> Reading directions are important. Rules are important. You know, when we have rules... There's rules to games. When we play a game of basketball or football or baseball, whatever the game might be, there are certain rules that you have to, to go by according to that. Well, there are rules that God has set down in the Word of God for us so that we might live this life and run this race in a proper manner and we might be strengthened in that race. And so we have to live according to those rules. But there are still people that are living life saying, life happens. Life just happens. You know, what am I going to do about it? Life just happens. Well, I want us to know that yet what also is true is that life is what we make of it. What are we going to make of the life that God has given to us? What are we going to make of this relationship and this opportunity that He gives us to live this life? You know, we were talking the other day, Debbie and I, and she's sitting on the couch. I'm, I'm sitting there and we, we're sharing together. And I was talking about the fact that what if, what if, I hadn't married my wife. My boys wouldn't be here. You know, what if uh, my wife had, as a baby, which she almost died, God spared her life, had she not lived? You know, God has given us each a purpose. Some of you maybe have, have had near-death experiences. Well, if God saved you, if He protected you, He's given you this life so that you might fulfill what He's called you to do. How many of you know we all have a purpose? Every person in this room has a purpose. For I know the plans, and he has plans for you, that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. So every person in the room here this morning, everyone that may be listening through Facebook today, God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for your life, and he wants to fulfill that, but we must surrender our will to his. And there are many times things that get in the way of that. Our character is not determined by how well we start the race, but it's determined how we finish the race. You know, I was fortunate, and, and I know I'll get a few boos here, but I was at the Michigan game yesterday, took Brandon and, and Addison and, and uh, Karsten up to that football game. It was, a, it was a great game. It was a great game. Um, we won 63 to 10. Now, if we could just do that against Ohio State one time, that would be nice, you know. But that, I doubt that's going to happen. But anyway, but you know what I noticed about the other team? They were down at one point, I think it was uh, 50, well, let's see, seven, yeah, uh, 56 to 3. And uh, you know what? I didn't see any of them lay down on the field and say, I quit. I didn't see any of them give up. They scored a touchdown after that. Their quarterback ran for a lot, like about 40 yards on one play. It was a wide open field, but they never gave up. Even though they lost the game, their character showed through in the fact that they didn't quit. You see, folks, in, in this life, there are going to be some hard things. There are going to be some difficult things, but life is going to be what are you going to make of it as the Holy Spirit gives you strength. What are you going to make of it? Are you going to stand firm in your walk and in your relationship with the Lord, even when difficulties and struggles come your way? 
Our character is determined by how we finish the race. You see, Paul could say, he says in, in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Today we'll be looking at how to finish this race and to finish it well. I want to talk to you about four things that everyone needs if they want to finish this race well. The first thing that I want us to hear, and what, what do you want to hear? You know, Matthew 25, 21 says in the New King James Version, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. How many of you want to hear that one day? Amen? Amen? That's what we all desire, is that that's what we hear come forth. Well, the first thing that we need to do is remove the hindrances. Remove the hindrances, those things that get in the way of our walk and our relationship with the Lord this morning. In, in Hebrews 12, 1, again, the second portion of that ver verse, it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. What are the things that drag you down? What are the struggles that you're facing that you have been holding on to and that keep you from this race? You see, by using this word weight and also the word sin, Side by side, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that there are things that, while they may not be sin, there are things that may distract you and I from this walk and this relationship with Jesus Christ. How many of you know that there are some things that you can do that I can't? Even though and it could become sin for me because the Lord has spoken to me about it, that I can't do those things. And the, for you, the same thing. There are certain things that would distract you. And, and if you held on to those things, then it's going to distract you in your walk and your relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. And so we need to lay those things aside. We need to set them aside in our lives. Different interests. God has a plan for us. Now, this word laying aside isn't a gentle removal. It's not like, okay, well, I'm just going to set this down here nice and gentle. How many of you... Um, how many of you uh, like to go out in the wintertime? Hmm? How many of you go out in shorts and, and t-shirt? No, you put on heavy clothes, right? You put on heavy clothes. How many of you would go skiing? You know, you wouldn't go skiing in, in a pair of shorts. I mean, snow skiing, right? But if you were, if you were to take those clothes that you would wear for, for regular snow skiing, and then you would say, okay, now I'm going to go uh, water skiing with those same clothes on, and you fall in the water, what are you going to do? If you fall in the water, you're going to begin to sink. So what are you going to do rapidly and, and viciously? You're going to begin to take those clothes off because you're going to sink to the bottom. You see, when a, a runner runs in, in a race, whether it's a marathon, uh, whether it's a 100-yard a, a dash, whatever it might be, they don't run in their sweats. They run in the least amount of clothing so that they can run faster they take away those things that are a hindrance to them so that they can run the race well well in our lives there are things that may be distracting us and discouraging us or keeping us from the purpose that god has in store for us that he wants to fulfill in your life and in mine and so what are those things we need to set those things aside what we need to understand is god has created us in a unique way if we live with any, expect, any other expect, expectations than God's. How many of you know people put expectations on us all the time? Right? And we think, well, I've got to live up to those. No, the expectations that you need to live up to are the expectations that God has for you. And so often we pick up the expectations of what everyone else wants for us. How many of you, uh, as you were growing up, your parents had expectations for you and you couldn't wait to get out of the house? <laughs> A few of you are being honest with me. <laughs> Sometimes the expectations that others put on us are not what God has for us. And so we need to listen to what the expectations are that God has for our lives. Are we going to be obedient to Him? We need to put those things aside that would hinder that walk and that, re and that relationship with the Lord. The writer of Hebrews tells us that if we want to finish well, we're going to have to simplify. To simplify. How many of you uh, have an attic full or a basement full of things that, boy, I need to simplify? <laughs> oh, 
I'm asking a lot of questions today, right? And you're having to, to, to pose an answer here for me. And I see some people looking around when, they're, when, the, when the others are raising their hands. You know, sometimes it's, it's best if we simplify things in our lives. Simplify things. We have possessions sometimes that we, that we think, oh, i got to have that, I have to have that. There are a lot of things that we need to get rid of, that we need to banish from our lives. You see, one of the main distractions is all the stuff that we acquire, our possessions. Man, when things start to go wrong and things start to change, you begin to wonder, how am I going to hold on to that? What am I going to do? How am I going to keep that? You know, one of the things that I, I really appreciated, when I was growing up, my Sunday school teacher, Milt Barlin, uh, a godly man, uh, he taught me, uh, again, we were in a small church, probably not much bigger than this church, just a little bit maybe, but it, it was in, in a small church, and he taught me up from, uh, I think, fourth grade all the way through eighth grade into ninth grade, I think it was into high school that he was my teacher. Because, again, he just kind of followed the kids that were in, in our group and followed them along. Well, he had a boat, and he loved to take us kids out in the summertime and go skiing. I never saw that man ski, but they said he was a fantastic skier. But he took time with us kids every single summer and it would invite us out. That's where I learned to water ski at. And uh, the thing that I really appreciated about Milt Barlin was that boat was never used on Sunday. He made it a point that I'm going to be in the house of God on Sunday. I'm not going to be out on the boat. He didn't let that become a distraction. How many of us know that sometimes when we, when we get involved in things and, and uh, different things that we can miss out on some things that God has for us because we're taking those times on Sunday to do other things than being in the house of God. And that can be a distraction. That can be a hindrance to our walk and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we start to worry about those things, and sometimes they put us on the sideline. Another hindrance is our past. One of the things that, that we can look at in our lives is, is the things that we've done that we're not very happy about, things that were displeasing to us, and we, we regret those things. But we need to forget about the past. Our past weighs us down, and that's because we've been over, maybe we've been overloaded with guilt, We've been weighed down with this guilt. Uh, we've been, uh, become resentful for what people have done to us. How many of you have ever been hurt by somebody in the church? I'm raising both hands. We've all been hurt by somebody in the church. I guarantee you, probably no person in this room hasn't been hurt by somebody in the church. But if you carry that weight with you, you will not get to the destination that God has for you. If you continue to hold on to those things that, that somebody hurts you, then you're, what you're going to do is you're going to have a, 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 sometimes a, a deep, fast slide back the other direction. That's the term backsliding, I believe. Where that we hold this resentment, we have this bitterness in our hearts and in our lives. Consider the Apostle Paul. He had a past that could have haunted him. You know, uh, he had been, he was, he was a murderer. He, he had... He had held the coats while they uh, stoned Stephen. He was one that, that went after Christians conti continuously until he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ on the, on the road to Damascus. But then how did the church treat him? The Jewish people, the Jewish synagogue, they didn't treat him very well after he came to the Lord. He could have held resentment and bitterness towards them. But, but he didn't do that. Consider it. Paul could have either focused on the guilt and the shame, or he could have held on to the resentment and the bitterness that, that could have overwhelmed him, but he laid it aside. He said in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to the goal, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Paul is saying he wasn't going to let those things hold him back. He was going to pursue the Lord. He was going to pursue what God had for him. And we see it very evident within his life as we read the scriptures. He had a race to run and he wasn't going to focus any longer on those things that were in the past. He was going to serve the Lord. He was going to live for him. He was going to win the prize that God had for him at the finish line. 
Now, through the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, and this is in the New King James Version also that I'm going to read it to you in, it says, forgetting the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do, not, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Folks, we've got a lot of things going on in our society right now. How many of you believe that God can still make a stream in the wilderness? In the wasteland. He can still provide and He can still minister, but we have to have the faith to believe that God is doing that great and wonderful thing, that new thing that He's going to spring forth, and that God wants to still use us as a church. He wants to minister through us. I'm going to encourage you again. If you haven't signed up yet for Awaken Medina County, Dot org. It's been up on the board here the last couple of weeks. You can still do that. We need more people to pray and to pray for individuals in Litchfield. All of my list has been Litchfield. How about the people that have received it? Have you all pretty much Litchfield? All of those that have received that, we're praying for different individuals. We don't know them, but we know that God does. And as we pray, as we pray in the Spirit, as we pray anointing upon them, as we pray that God would, would break down the barriers and the strongholds of the enemy, we're praying that God will move in, the, in, in Medina County, in the Litchfield area. But others are praying uh, for people in Medina County from other churches. And so we want to continue to do that. We want to see souls saved and, and, and ministered to in this time. So please go on to that. Get, get 10 names and start praying for them now. You, you don't need to do it during that window. They said that you can do it at other times too. But the more we're praying together, the more God can do a, a great work. So let's get involved with that. You see, God has a special race for each and every one of us. He's got an opportunity for you and I to use us to minister to the lives of people around us. How many of you are praying for your families that are away from the Lord? You're praying for them? Are you praying for your church family, that God will lift them up and encourage them? Are we lifting one another up in prayer? Are we standing with one another? So the first thing that we need to do is remove everything that is hindering our progress. Any distractions that we have, any weight that we're holding on to, you know, possessions can get in the way the things of the past, the things that people have done to us, those things can get in the way. If you're carrying that burden, you need to release that today. You need to let go of it. And you need to let God. And sometimes the guilt and the shame, how many of you know that God is not bringing condemnation on you? The enemy will try to bring condemnation on you, but once it's under the blood, it's under the blood and it's forgiven. And God wants you to have peace. So the second thing is we need to remember the reward. Remember the reward that God has for us. We can't run the race well if we, keep our, if we don't fix our eyes on the finish line. And I believe that's what we need to do. We need to keep our eyes fixed and focused on the finish line. Uh, how many of you have ever uh, seen somebody run backwards in a race? No? Now sometimes we used to do wind sprints when I was in... in uh, Basketball, you know, go to the, to the uh, foul line, come back to the end line, go to the center line and come back. But you had to run that backwards when you were going backwards. But you had to kind of look back over your shoulder so you didn't run into somebody else or trip and, and know when you're getting back to that finish line. But we always have to keep our eyes fixed. And so are we fixing our eyes on the finish line, on the rewards that God has? How many of you know that there's a great reward coming in heaven? for those that serve the Lord. I was reading something uh, yesterday, and uh, it, was, it was talking about the different individuals that died that didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of these were on their deathbed, people that were famous individuals. And it was amazing to me reading those things that people had documented of those individuals that talked about how foolish they had been all the way up to the end, and they hadn't accepted the Lord, but they were looking at dread as they looked ahead. What have I done? The various things that they said. Folks, this life is in preparation for our eternity, and where will we spend that eternity? Will we spend it in heaven, or will we spend it in hell? There's only two opportunities and two op uh, options for us to take advantage of, and it, hell is not an advantage, believe me. 
But Paul is saying he wasn't going to let the things of his past drag him down. So remember the reward. We can't run this race if we don't keep our eyes fixed upon the finish line. The way, the why. Why? Why determines so much? Why do we need to keep focused on that? If, if, if the why is tied to short-term goals, we're not going to make it. The why has to be tied to long-term goals. That I'm in this for the finish line. I'm in this to go all the way. I've determined. You know, uh, we, we have to make a determination early on in our walk and our relationship with the Lord that nothing is going to keep us from this prize. We're going to receive the rewards that God has in store for us. So when we feel like giving up, let's focus on the finish line and, and see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 25 and 26, and this is in the Living Bible. He says, to win the contest, you must deny yourself many things. Whew. Again, there are some things that you're going to have to set aside. Deny yourself many things that would keep you from doing your best. What do you need to set aside today? Are there hindrances in your walk, in your relationship with the Lord that you're holding on to? He says, we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. You know, this life is so short. How many of you, as you've gotten older, realize how short it is? You know, I, I look at my, my kids, uh, they're not young, so young anymore. Uh, they're, they're, Brandon's getting ready to be 40. John's getting ready to turn 44. And I think, boy, that life has gone so fast. I remember when they were small. I thought, I thought those years at, at times because of uh, the struggles of changing diapers and, and just the problems that you had in the home, when is this going to end? But now that that's over, I'm looking at my grandson who's 16 now and, and the youngest, Connie, who's four, and, and I realize how quickly life passes. Folks, what matters is what are we doing towards eternity? How are we living this life? Are we running the race with endurance and with perseverance today? To win the race, he says, so I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. A heaven reward personally rewarded by God. Now think about that for a moment. I don't know about you, but that puts a little bit of trembling into me. I'm going to stand before God. But you know what? What do I have? I have the blood of Jesus Christ that covers my sin and my stain. Amen. Because without it, I would be nothing. I would, I, I would be banished to hell. But because of the grace of God, because of his blood that has been shed, I have cleansing and I have forgiveness of sin. Some people wonder if there are any heavenly rewards. Some people say the problem is that their idea of God's reward is based upon what side uh, of good and, and evil they have done. It's like a scale that you have the balancing of the scale, and if I do more good than I do bad, then, then I'll get into heaven. Let me tell you, it doesn't work that way, because none of us would make it if we did it that way. Not one of us. It's because of the grace of God that he extends to you and I because of the blood. You see, Jesus never took his eyes off of the goal that he had when he was here upon this earth, and his goal was to go to the cross because he loved you. That was his goal, to be obedient to the cross, to go to the cross so that you could have cleansing, you could have forgiveness of your sins. That's why he went. Because he loved you. Because he loved me. That's why he went to the cross. Fortunately, God doesn't reward us based on that scale. His rewards are based upon the grace that he has extended to each of us. Every day, that grace that is given to us. All the sins we've committed... That forgiveness is based on his blood. It's be because he was willing to hang on that cross for you and me. You see, the idea of eternal rewards uh, is foreign to, to most because of the things that, when things get difficult, and a lot of times what people do is, is when things get difficult and they, they're, they're turning away from the Lord or they think they can fill something up, they, they turn to the television, they turn to internet, they say, well, if I just go on a vacation, if I just change some things that way, if I, I take a few days off for the weekend, or but no weekend, no vacation, no TV, no internet is going to replace 
the presence of God that you need in your heart and in your life. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy, Holy God that we serve. The third thing, we need to resist discouragement. How many of you get discouraged sometimes? Scripture says that, that we're going to be discouraged at times. It says in Psalm 23, 7, the Bible says that as a person thinks within their hearts, that's what, they eventually, that's what they're eventually going to become. Discouragement comes easy when we focus on our health, when we focus sometimes on our finances, on our marriage, sometimes on our children, sometimes on our job. It can become discouraging, but you and I have a choice. We can choose to focus on the things of God. We have a choice every day. And though discouragement will come, D.L. Moody said this, he says, I've never known God to use a discouraged person. How many of you want to be used by God? Say amen. amen. Then we have to keep away from discouragement. We have to make a choice. How many of you know it's a choice? I make a choice. I'm not going to let this get me down. Um, I remember a message that uh, Pastor Brown spoke one time and he used this comment. He said, uh, he said uh, uh, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Well, you know, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we need to share with somebody so that, and, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I think there are times that we need to, to, to express the joy of the Lord even though we may not feel it. How many of you know there are times that we don't feel it? But I have to make a choice. I have to make a choice. Are we going to serve the Lord and not allow discouragement to overtake us? We have to stand firm in this walk, in this relationship. Discouragement is the opposite of faith. It's the opposite. Because it looks at problems through the human understanding. You see, discouragement looks at the things the way that they are. Right now in our society, how many of you know that, that and they're not reporting much of it, but, but we're seeing more and more suicides today. They're on the rise. You're not seeing a lot of it. Why? Because people have become discouraged and they don't see any hope. And so that's what they're looking at. And, and, and there's one person that I have talked to within the last month or so that in talking to them, I'm concerned for them because they don't see any hope. They don't see any hope in the future and they're a young person. They, 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 they have no hope. Even though they've had a relationship with the Lord, they're, they're confused, they're, they're, they're discouraged. And so that person is on my prayer list. I'm praying that God will strengthen them and, and help their eyes to be open. See, the enemy wants to bring discouragement that holds us down and keeps us from the purpose that God has for us. And I want you to know this morning, God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you, and he doesn't want it to be one of discouragement. He wants you to lift him up and praise him, exalt him, and stand close to him. So it's through those understanding. You see, we need to look at things and our problems through the eyes of faith this morning. Through the eyes of faith, believing that God is going to make a way and he's going to open those doors in our lives. Look at how the Apostle Paul approached discouragement in Galatians 6, 9. It says in the New King James Version, it says this, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season, I love that, due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. One reason that we get tired of doing what is right is because doing what is wrong is much easier. You know, it's, more e it, it's easier to be selfish than to be unselfish. How many of you would agree? <laughs> How many of you would agree that it's easier to tell a lie than it is to tell the truth, especially if it's going to get you in trouble? Huh? Yeah, yeah those are things that we, you, you know, it's easier to do those things. Why should we resist the urge and not get tired of doing what's right? It's found in the phrase, in due season. In due season. In other words, after a while, we're going to reap a harvest. We're going to reap a harvest. Keep doing right. Keep doing the good thing. Keep following the rules, as 2 Timothy 2.5 says. Keep following the rules that God has given to us. Keep standing upon the Word and trusting Him. In the midst of all the dis discouraging things that are going on in the world, God is still in control, folks. He is still in control this morning, and He wants to work in and through your life in this time. 
Think of it like a newly planted seed of corn. What happens when you plant a seed of corn in the ground? How many of you say, well, I'm going to get two more little kernels of corn? Is that what happens? No, God's, God's economy is that when you plant a seed, you're going to get so much more. So, you know, so, some people say, well, you know, I tried tithing once, but God didn't bless me, so I'm going to get away from tithing. I don't want to do that. I didn't see a, an immediate, immediate response from God, and so I'm not going to tithe. Well, the, the, the Scripture talks about giving, and it will be given back to you. In Malachi 3.10, the Lord speaks about giving, and He will bring a blessing. He said, the, the storehouse can't hold everything that I'm going to do for you if you'll be faithful in your giving unto the Lord. He, as we are faithful, God gives back. How many of us uh, at times have, have done something and we thought, well, we're going to see fruit from it immediately, but it didn't. It was maybe 10, 15 years before we saw anything. You ever been there? Yeah. There are times. And see, we, we sometimes place a time limit on God, and God doesn't have a time limit. He's on His own time, and you need to be on His time. We need to allow Him to, to direct what's going on in our lives. So, why does God delay? I believe it's so that He can grow us. He can mature us. He can teach us. There are times that we have to see that delay and that, you know, um, how many times have we, we uh, blessed somebody or given to somebody and thought we would get something back in return and it never, we never seemingly came? How many of you know it doesn't always come in finances if we're tithing? How many of you know that God gives us blessings in so many other ways? In our health, uh, He gives it in friendships and relationships and, and blessings of the peace of God that come upon us. We've been blessed. We've been, we've been blessed. But we live in a society that is, is instant gratification. That's what we want in our society today. We need to learn to have faith and trust in God no matter how long it takes. We're going to serve Him. We're going to be faithful with what He's given us in His Word and be obedient to it. Let me just say this. Anything worth doing is worth the time and investment that we put into it. Anything that's worth doing, it, it, it takes time. It's, it's an investment that we put into it. Uh, Michelangelo uh, did the, the sculpture of David. Uh, yeah, just one hit of the hammer and it all fell apart and there it was, right? Three years it took him to make that, that, that sculpture. Three years it took him. Chipping away easily. You see, there are a lot of things in this life. In order to make a masterpiece, God's still working on you. He's still working on me. I thank the Lord that He is still working on me, that He hasn't given up on me. You know, but it takes time to make a masterpiece. The Lord is working on your heart and upon your life to strengthen you and to lift you up. It's a long process to make a, a masterpiece. To fight discouragement, let me give you three things in this section, three things that we need to remember to keep from discouragement this morning. Number one is God's goodness. Folks, we need to remember the things that God has already done for us. You need to hold on to those things. You need to remember when God brought you out of a difficult time and when He met a need financially. Uh, You've heard me from the pulpit many times talk about just the different things that God opened up for us to even to go into ministry and the things that He did even before that preparing us for ministry and how that God opened those doors and those avenues and, and we had to trust Him in the midst of that. But, but we have to remember those good things. We need to remember those and hold them before the Lord. The times that the Lord's answered prayer, the times that He brought joy and peace in our troubled hearts and the difficulties that we face. The next thing is we need to remember God's presence. Remember that no matter what, God said that He would never leave you nor forsake you. He's going to be with you wherever you're at. You know, it's, it's wonderful to know that uh, we can be out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the other day on, on television, they had the movie Castaway, and I just caught a little bit of it, Tom Hanks in that movie. You know, I'm thinking about this guy out here, and I don't remember him ever in that movie. He probably did, but I don't remember it. Calling out to God. Did he call out to God in any way? You know, but you know what? If, <clears throat> if you're marooned on a desert island, God's there with you. 
I don't care where you're at. How many of you can f- have felt like you've in, been in a crowded room but felt like you were all alone? Amen. God's there with you. God's there with you. There are times that we have those feelings. But again, we cannot live by our feelings, folks. We cannot live by our feelings. We must go by faith. And that takes, uh, again, a heart that is sold out and committed to the Lord. And the third thing is we need to remember God's promises. Remember his promises. Uh, especially his greatest one, and that's that he would be with us and that he would save us from our sins. And that relationship that we can have, a personal relationship with him day in and day out. The key to defeating discouragement is to change our focus off the world and off of ourselves and to get our focus on God. That's why I love, you know, when we come in and we begin to praise God, we worship the Lord, we're getting our focus off of everything else for that period of time. And God's preparing our hearts for the message to come forth. And, you know, we need this. I, I don't know about you, but I need church. I need church. I need to be in the house of God. I need to spend time with God's people. This is a refreshing. This is what it is. It's a, it's a place that we can come and be refreshed in the, in the word of the Lord today. Praise God for it. You know, it's, it's a focus. And what's the focus should be on God's goodness his presence, and his promises. Keep your eyes fixed and focused on him this morning. And so we first, we need to remove the hindering, uh, whatever is hindering our walk in the Lord. We need to get rid of that. Next, remember our rewards. And next, we need to forget our past failures. Move on. And then resist discouragement in whatever form that it takes. And then lastly, finally, we need to renew ourselves daily in the Lord. Renew ourselves daily in the Lord. We have to find those ways to recharge our physical and our spiritual batteries every day. Uh, Think about this. You know, these jet fighters, jet, jet pilots, sometimes they refuel in the air. You ever seen that? You know, I've never been up there to see it, but I've seen it on film. That's kind of neat to watch them. What are they doing? They're, they're refueling so they can keep on their mission so they can go forward. And that's what we need to be. We need to, in the, in the process of where God has placed us, he wants us to stay recharged and refueled. How many of you know that physical, it, it, it's good to keep ourselves physically fit? It really is. Because if I'm, if I'm tired, if I'm worn out, I, it's going to be hard for me to do the things that God has called me to do. So I need to do the very best that I can to stay physically fit in this body that God has given to me. But physical renewal, the scripture says in in Psalm 127 and verse 2, it says, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, and so he gives his beloved sleep. How foolish it would be to go on four hours of sleep every night. What's going to happen? We're going to become fatigued. We're not going to be able to, to, to function the way that God intended for us to function. Vince Lombardi, famous football coach for the Green Bay Packers, said this. He said, fatigue makes cowards of all of us. Fatigue makes cowards of all of us. So we need to keep our bodies physically strong and do the best. You know, eating properly is healthy and it keeps our body energized. Eating the right things, putting those into our bodies are very important. Yet the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, 8, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. What this says is that while God is, is, is good, uh, he wants us to keep physically, the most important thing is that spiritually we stay where we need to be. We need to stand strong. We need to stay spiritually strong in our walk and our relationship with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. This physical body, from the day we were born, began to perish. We grew, we, you know, we're getting older. Um, how many of you, everything functions exactly the way it used to when you were 20? <laughs> No, no. Things have changed. Things have, have, have changed drastically in our bodies. So don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The way we become spiritually renewed is by being in the Word of God on a daily basis. 
spending time with him in prayer, being in the house of God at every opportunity that the Lord avails us to so that we might grow, that we might be encouraged, spending time with other Christian brothers, brothers and sisters so that we might be able to also be energized then to share the gospel with those that are in the lost, uh, in, in the world that are lost. We need to be able to share that gospel with them also. You see, Jesus never gave up, even though he knew that the cross was ahead of him. He never gave up. He never lost heart, never lost hope. He knew that what he was doing was for you and I. He was, it says in Philippians 2, 8, he was obedient even unto death. Obedient even unto death. He knew that's what his purpose was. He had a purpose on this earth. He, he discipled uh, the apostles. He ministered to the lives of people. On a, uh, on a daily basis for three and a half years while he was here upon this earth. And I'm sure he had impact even before that upon his family and upon others that he knew in the, in the community in which he lived. But his goal, his uh, purpose in life was to fulfill that calling that was placed upon him to be obedient even unto death. And he did that for you and I. It's never too late. God's not finished with you. He's not finished with me. It's never too late to, to refocus and to allow the Spirit of God to change you, to, to grow you, to teach you, to develop your walk and your relationship with Him. We may have tripped and fallen. We may have uh, maybe even been sidelined at times because of discouragement. But God's not done with you yet. He's got a plan for you.